السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم احسن ویلکمس یو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان لیٹ اس گیٹ ان ٹو لیکچر نمبر تھرٹی ون آف برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور آئی بن ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ چینلس آف ڈسٹریبیوشن اوور دا پاسٹ تھری لیکچرس اینڈ ویل لائک ٹو دا برنگ دیٹ ڈسکشن ٹو این اینڈ ان اے شارٹ وائل بائی گیونگ یو اے کنکلوژن آف وٹ وی ہیو ڈسکسڈ سو فار I talked about uh, the importance of uh, the channels of distribution and uh, those strategic considerations which uh, we must take into account before deciding what kinds of uh, channel systems we should opt for. We have uh, the different choices and options. So therefore, strategic inputs are the ones which lead us into deciding what kinds of channels are uh, the best suitable under the circumstances uh, with which surround the one particular company. I also talked about uh, the value which uh, the good channels could build up because uh, it has to be the responsibility of a good channel system that uh, it develop customer value. It offers the company good profitability and uh, it, uh, it has a very good outreach. And naturally, if a system has a good outreach, it will offer the company the good uh, the sales revenue and uh, therefore a good level of profitability. The system has to be cost efficient and customer effective. The meaning it must not be the very expensive. At the same time, it must be the one which serves the customers the way they want to be served. So with giving you a conclusion of uh, the channel systems, let me rephrase uh, the whole thing uh, like this that a business may have uh, a very high quality product or uh, the set of services, but unless it is successful in delivering those products and services to the target market very efficiently and effectively, it will not succeed at the game of marketing. Customers could have preferences for uh, the products and services in view of their uh, the benefits and They also have preferences for um, the place of buying those products. They certainly have uh, the preference for uh, the place of purchase. And that is something companies can have got to be very sensitive about and must go for those systems which can ensure that. Businesses, on the other hand, have their own priorities. They have the preferences to deliver efficiently and effectively and at the same time they like to build image of the product they are selling. So in other words, unless there is an equilibrium between um, the requirements of the customers and the requirements of businesses, a channel system is not going to be a highly optimal system. In other words, in order for a system to be optimal and very effective and equilibrium between customers' requirements and businesses' requirements is a must. Let us take a look at this with the help of um, a graphic illustration. As you can see from um, this um, illustration, uh, we have uh, the customers' requirements on the left-hand side and uh, the business requirements on the right-hand side. Take a good look at uh, these circles on the customer side. Uh, the one shows their uh, the preference for uh, the products and services in view of the benefits because they must enjoy the benefits and that is what they buy those products for. The other thing which is uh, the very visible from uh, this illustration is that uh, the customers certainly have a preference uh, for the point of purchase. It is their decision to go to a certain place which they like and it is the responsibility of the company, or for that matter, uh, the channel system, uh, to make sure that um, the products or services of the company uh, are available there. Take a look at the right-hand side of this illustration and you will see it relates to the businesses. Uh, the businesses have uh, their um, requirements to build the image, and they cannot build the image of the product unless they make sure that the product is available everywhere. Quality is a given. 
quality has been produced. Now we are talking about the channels, meaning the phases through which the manufactured product is passing through in order to get into the final hands of the consumers. So image building is a function of not only the quality which is produced in the factories, but also the quality of service which the companies offer to their customers and consumers in order for the products to get into their respective hands. And uh, the other thing which, um, I mean, another preference of uh, the businesses is that they've got to be very efficient in terms of uh, costing and they also have to be very effective in terms of the outreach. So we can uh, gonna summarize this thing further by saying that um, depending on the nature of the product, the outreach desired and um, uh, a few other uh, strategic goals, companies can, must decide whether they would like to go for a direct system of channels or an indirect system of channels. So in other words, these are the few factors which must be considered very carefully uh, before deciding how and why we should be better off with one given system of channels. Market experience of uh, the major players uh, in this area is also a very good guide. And I pointed out this thing uh, while I just started uh, talking about uh, the, the channels and uh, the importance of channels that uh, whatever is uh, in fashion in the marketplace has got to be considered. Because if all the major players are following a certain pattern, there's got to be uh, a logic and a rationale uh, to that practice. And uh, this is not to say that we must follow uh, the major players all the time. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, we must look into um, the leads which we might get in terms of improving our systems. Because uh, we might uh, observe a few things here and there um, that um, are going to offer us opportunities for improvement. Uh, I mean, the kind of things which are not being uh, followed by the major players only because things are working for them very well. And uh, if you think that uh, by becoming a little ingenious or creative for that matter, uh, you can bring about improvements uh, which will lead toward uh, the cost efficiency and customer effectiveness, the two strategic things we must never forget, then we must go for those improvements, the meaning that we should think in terms of bringing certain changes. Uh, in other further words, we can say that uh, we should go for a mixture of different systems or different methods which we think fit very well into our strategic framework because every company is surrounded by its own circumstances. Every company has its own situation. And what is working for one company it may not work as well for another company. So instead of following somebody else in a blind manner, one should first look into the considerations which are very strategic in nature and then decide for the kind of systems that one must have. As a final statement toward the channels system, I can summarize the whole thing like this, that generally it is a mixture of different systems that companies generally employ. And it is the mix of those systems which really optimize the channel and therefore leverage your brand. The systems that you opt for have to be the one which must leverage the brand. If the brand stands leveraged, it automatically means that you have a very good coverage of the market. And if you have good coverage, you have a good share of the market. And if you have good share, you have good sales revenues and good level of profitability. So much for the channels. And uh, I hope that uh, we all are very clear about uh, the kind of systems that uh, we should be working for once we get into the practical field. Another important area which I would like to touch upon here is uh, what you might have heard about co-branding. 
Now, co-branding is something which can be discussed in the context of the brand architecture because it certainly has the overtones which belong to the architectural side of the branding and the portfolios and so on and so forth. But the reason I've chosen to talk about co-branding here, while I'm just about concluding the discussion on the channels systems, is that co-branding generally takes place in order to exert control on the channel, two brands join hands and uh, they operate within the same marketing space. How they operate within the same marketing space, I'm just going to talk about that. It can take uh, so many different shapes and forms. Uh, one of the ways which is very common uh, with the for co-branding all over the world is that uh, two brands uh, bundle themselves and uh, they bundle themselves uh, by way of uh, coining a new brand name in a way that uh, the new brand name manifests um, the strengths of uh, the two companies uh, which are already known in the marketplace. How this bundling starts is that uh, one of the brands is not very strong. And the brand is not very really strong only because it cannot exert control on the channel. And it talks with another brand which is very really strong in terms of uh, its channel systems. Let us try to explain this with the help of an example. There's a company which specializes in selling packaged yogurt. And there's a company that sells ice cream. So the both companies are doing very well in their particular relevant segments. The yogurt company is selling a lot of yogurt and the ice cream company is reaching its customers very well and it offers a lot of customer value, it makes the good profitability, so on and so forth. But the yogurt company is not all that strong in so many different channels. It is strong in one particular channel. It is seeking to get into a chain of restaurants which happens to be a channel in itself. And it seeks to get into that chain of restaurants by offering a new product. And that product is ice cream yogurt. Basically being a yogurt company, it has the expertise to start making ice cream yogurt and uh, it starts talking with the ice cream company with which is selling its ice cream through that particular chain of restaurants. Convincing that company to join hands and in the process, creating a new brand name which highlights the ice cream company as well as the yogurt company. The ice cream company is selling its brand by the name of uh, High Cream. It is a supposition. And the yogurt company is selling its brand by the name of Novelty. Again, as a matter of supposition. The two decide to create a new brand by the name of Novel Cream and start selling that brand through that chain of restaurants. Why that chain of restaurants accepts the new brand and the new product? Because in the first place, it is convinced of the brand product relationship. That is what we have learned. And it also is convinced of uh, the, the marketing promise of um, the company that sells the ice cream and the company that has been selling ice cream and is still selling ice cream to that particular chain. On its own, the yogurt company could not be successful in getting into that chain, but with the help of this ice cream company, it has succeeded to get in there. So now it starts exerting some level of control and power in terms of the channel. It is a pairing of brands, it is a contraction of names, and it is sharing of profits. It may not be as um, attractive in terms of uh, customer value and profitability in relation to one particular brand as it is in case of co-branding, because it is two companies that have joined hands, it is two brands that, that have joined hands, so it certainly has an element of complexity, and that complexity has to be handled by people like you, meaning the brand managers. But then the fact remains the brand has to capitalize on the channel and uh, 
uh, one company which is weak in that respect seeks the help of another company and that company thinking that uh, it may not be in a position to introduce this kind of a product which the yogurt company is offering to introduce because it requires um, a decent level of um, investment to introduce the product, uh, investment in terms of operation, in investment in terms of the human resource and logistics and so, so on and so forth. And therefore, it also thinks to itself, it may not be a bad idea in the name of uh, pragmatism uh, that took the rejoin hands and uh, introduced something by the name of novelty cream. So this is the one example of the co-branding. And this kind of a co-branding is known co-branding by bundling, where you bundle two products and create the one name by contracting the names of two brands in a way that people can think to themselves immediately. I mean, the customers can think to themselves immediately that this looks like a product introduced by these, these two different companies. Well, you highlight uh, the names of uh, your respective companies in one way or the other so that uh, your customers and consumers uh, end up knowing the background of uh, the one or the ones uh, who have uh, introduced the brand. The other um, form of uh, the co-branding is uh, what they call uh, co-branding by ingredient. And to give you a classic example of uh, the co-branding by ingredient, I would like to go back to uh, the so many different books which are um, which all they give this example and that is a name which is very well known to you people who are so much into computers intel take a look at almost any computer it says intel inside so that is the one brand which has gone into another brand and is supporting the overall product i mean the bigger product which you are buying and which you call a computer system You can take a look at a, a few uh, consumer items and uh, they will recall that, uh, that there are consumer item companies, uh, in particular uh, the food companies, that uh, get into this kind of a uh, practice. Um, there's a brand of um, the one food item, uh, let's not name it, and um, it carries the names of two companies and it also carries uh, the names of two brands. Here, we're not talking about a contraction of two different names. We are talking of two different brands, like, you know, a computer says, okay, the one brand name it is, and the other brand which it carries inside of it. So, okay, by the same token, uh, there is a tea brand, for example, and it carries okay, the inside of it, uh, the maybe um, powdered milk, and uh, they are uh, promoting uh, their two brands um, collectively or in a cooperative way, that this is another example of uh, the co-branding. Co-branding also takes on um, another form, and that is distribution. The two brands could, could be distributed by one company. Now, when two brands are uh, distributed by one company, it automatically means that they both give each other strength. They both leverage each other. They do not threat each other. Because if that is the case, the two brands will never join hands. Co-branding also uh, takes place in terms of uh, the using uh, the one channel of distribution for promotion. Take the example of uh, the travel agents that uh, promote airlines along with hotels. They offer you so many different packages. Uh, go to this country, they go to that country, go to the northern part of the country, and uh, they offer you tickets, they offer you hotels, the accommodation, and all the services. So okay, the co-branding in this kind of okay, this scenario okay, that takes place uh, okay, between, not only between two brands, it may take place among okay, the more than two. Okay, the, it is the airline or maybe it is okay, the one of the transportation companies. It could be hotels and it also is okay, the, those companies that offer uh, ground services. On a vacation, okay, you have to surface okay, a lot of area. So okay, the ground uh, transportation companies also come into the picture. Uh, there are so many different uh, the ways and means uh, whereby uh, co-branding uh, can take place. Another example uh, before I am done with uh, this concept is uh, uh, the loyalty programs uh, of one particular brand 
um, with being uh, promoted with the help of another brand. Uh, for example, um, a, a credit card, which basically is uh, a financial product, uh, a financial consumer product, uh, by banks uh, promoting another company's uh, loyalty program. You use this particular credit card and in return for uh, a higher level of use, you accumulate uh, so many points. Just one example. And uh, against those points, you can go to the gas stations and uh, meaning petrol pumps and uh, buy the gasoline there. So companies could get into partnerships and alliances. Uh, the partnerships, not really in terms of uh, sharing money and uh, buying each of those assets, uh, but working partnerships. And uh, these are the kind of uh, the brand, the joint ventures, uh, where two companies uh, cooperate with each other so that their two brands could be promoted at the same time by exerting control over the channel. So this is kind of uh, a marketing effort, a collaborative marketing effort which uh, supports the brand uh, more so by way of uh, the channel systems and less so by other tools. And that is why I chose to talk about co-branding in relation to uh, the channel systems. Uh, so much for the co-branding and the channel system. And uh, this uh, brings us uh, to uh, the completion of uh, the one more important step uh, within the, uh, the brand management strategic process. And uh, we now move on to another step uh, which uh, is equally important. And in a way, it is going to be much more important for you guys uh, because uh, this is one area uh, which you are going to deal with immediately uh, upon your arrival into the practical field. And that is the area of communication. What communication is all about? What are the different elements of communication? And what are the strategic considerations which we must take into account before deciding the tools that we undertake to go for those communications is going to be the area or the topic which I'm going to cover um, in this and uh, in the following few lectures. And I will repeat that, uh, that this is going to be uh, the area with which you're going to be dealing with immediately upon your stepping into the practical field. Uh, because uh, this deals with the advertising, it deals with promotions, and it deals with uh, all other tools of communication which you use in order to promote your brand. It goes without saying that uh, the communication in present day's world is of extremely high importance. Uh, the fact of the matter is that without a certain level of communication, the, your product just cannot succeed in the marketplace. This may sound like an oversimplified kind of a statement, but that is a fact. No matter however high is the quality of your product and uh, however effective is uh, the system of distribution, the optimal level of success which you really want in relation to the brand picture, the brand promise and the brand vision, meaning in relation to all the strategic goals that you cannot achieve uh, the right level of marketing success. So communication from that point of view is uh, very important and um, the importance cannot be overemphasized, let's put it that way. And without an effective communication system, uh, there's no way that we really can achieve all the goals that we envisage as part of the brand vision. I'm repeating this thing in light of the importance the concept carries. An effective program is designed to make uh, meaning. An effective communication program is designed by people like you to make your product known, the meaning to create awareness about the product. An effective program is designed in order to remind the target market of that particular brand. An effective program is designed not only to remind and reinforce the image of the brand, but also to make sure that your customers within the target market uh, do take action and go for the desired purchase. 
effective communication programs are uh, designed in order to make sure that uh, the people retain in their minds um, the image of your brand, the, the benefits that it offers, and therefore they buy your brand over and over again. So this is what communication generally does in very simple words. What else communication does is that it brings positioning of the brand to life. It really animates the brand. It gives life to positioning. And you will recall from um, your learning uh, about positioning that uh, you cannot make a home in the minds of the consumers uh, unless the position of the brand, meaning the intended position of the brand, is well communicated. Unless you communicate the position of the brand, there is just no way that it is going to make a home in consumers' minds. So it becomes very important. A well-positioned product, I will state it like this, that the well-positioned product that offers a very good customer value and that also is subject to a very good um, system of uh, the channel uh, the management uh, that just cannot succeed in the marketplace if it is not supported by a good level of communication. And it is that good level of communication which uh, brings to life uh, all the elements of the marketing mix. So in other words, if a company thinks to itself that um, we have such a beautiful product uh, which is you know, full of life and it is full of quality and it is being distributed by such a wonderful system that uh, there's no way that the product is going to fail in the marketplace. Well, the product may not fail, but the product at the same time may not succeed to the point where you would like it to succeed. The meaning in absolute uh, compatibility and an absolute match with, with the brand vision. The brand has got to be as successful as you envisaged in the brand vision. Well, if your vision is like um, a fulfillment of okay, the certain level of okay, the sales revenues and profitability, which you can attain okay, just by offering a very good customer value okay, with the support of okay, the good channel system, that is something else. But I doubt it. I don't think you will stop there or you should stop there. You have to have a vision okay, which um, fully exploits the complete properties of the brand and uh, the fully exploits its uh, the potential and uh, the offers value uh, to the customers not only uh, in terms of uh, the, the benefits, I mean the physical benefits, but also uh, it should um, uh, develop certain emotional values and emotional relationships with uh, the target market in a way that they buy your product over and over again. And that is the role uh, which is uh, played very effectively by communication. Communication has got to be very effective. How do we go for effective communication? Uh, what are the elements and uh, what are the strategic considerations? Well, uh, we should be talking about all those uh, step by step and phase by phase. Having said all that, uh, I can say that uh, the successful communication uh, stems from uh, the four strategic areas. And these are the four areas which basically are uh, uh, the basis of um, with all the, the marketing decisions. Number one being the corporate vision, number two being uh, brand vision, and the third being a brand picture and brand positioning. Not only that, uh, the good communication strategy uh, stems from uh, these four strategic areas, but the once a communication strategy uh, takes shape and it is implemented, it also reinforces and fortifies these particular areas. So in other words, they complement each other. Having talked about uh, all this, uh, I would now like to uh, tell you about all the tools uh, which you are going to have at your disposal uh, when you develop a communication strategy. Now, these are the tools uh, which you uh, already have gone through in terms of learning uh, when you did your the basic marketing course, but uh, for the sake of um, uh, consistency and for the sake of developing the right kinds of relationships uh, between these tools and uh, the strategic considerations uh, which you are going to have into account, 
to develop a, an effective communication strategy, I must talk about those. And uh, those are advertising. Number two, promotions. Promotions are divided into, into two sub areas. But the one is the trade promotions and uh, the other is consumer promotions. Okay, I think we all know that uh, we carry out promotions at the level of uh, uh, the channel members okay, to induce them into uh, doing a few good things for the company, which I will talk about later. And uh, the consumer promotions are all about uh, uh, actuating consumers uh, to buy your brand over and over again and also in bigger quantities so that they get so much hooked onto your brand that uh, they do not forget buying it uh, the next time. The third tool of uh, the advertising is uh, the event marketing and uh, sponsorships. Uh, this is something which is uh, the gaining a lot of uh, the popularity nowadays. Um, you watch so many different television channels and uh, you know every now and then here and there uh, there is a there's, there's, there's a huge um, uh, program going on uh, in relation to promotion of one particular brand, but um, the vehicle is uh, something else. Uh, the vehicle may be in the shape of um, celebrities and so on and so forth that um, bring to your brand uh, a lot of promotional mileage. The fourth tool of uh, communications is uh, direct marketing. Now, direct marketing is something which I talked about as part of the uh, channels area also. Uh, but direct marketing takes on uh, communication overtones because it takes place with the help of a telephone, uh, with the help of a fax system, and uh, with the help of uh, electronic systems, with the meaning e-marketing. Uh, I did talk about that uh, in relation to the channels. And uh, I will be talking about uh, the direct marketing again in the context of uh, the communications because this does carry with itself a lot of communication value and communication and selling directly um, take place at the same time. Another tool um, of um, the communications is uh, internal communications like you have uh, newsletters which you distribute, uh, first of all, among uh, all the members of the organization and uh, among the members of your sister organizations, uh, among um, all those who are associated with you. Uh, for example, with the company that has gone into a brand joint venture uh, in terms of uh, the co-branding, that you would like to send your communication to that company in order to make them aware of uh, all the, uh, the measures that you intend to take in relation to your brand and uh, the brand communication. So these are uh, uh, some of the tools which uh, you are going to have uh, at your disposal uh, while developing uh, communication strategies. Advertising and promotions, of course, it goes without saying, they happen to be two of the most important tools that uh, any of the marketing persons have at their disposal. Um, these are the most uh, the widely used tools and these are the most popular tools and these are the most effective tools. Uh, the only thing is that, uh, that these also happen to be uh, expensive tools. So it is uh, about their being expensive that you have uh, to make the right decisions uh, about uh, a mix of uh, different tools which you should be um, employing toward your strategy and we shall be talking about that uh, every now and then and like I get pointed out uh, before a couple of times in my lectures wait until I undertake uh, the last the one or two lectures in which I shall be developing a brand plan um, and uh, talking about uh, how you uh, develop these strategies and uh, the statements of all the strategies with which you should have in place and which lead to the tactical and executional details. So wait until that time. Back to advertising and promotions, the two the most effective uh, but nevertheless uh, expensive tools of uh, the communications. Advertising and promotions are two terminologies which at times are used interchangeably. 
Uh, before I proceed to the further with uh, the lecture, let me clarify that the advertising and promotions are two different things and therefore cannot be uh, talked about interchangeably. The one just cannot be taken for the other. Advertising is an all paid for persuasive communication in the main media of television, press, radio and cinema. This is what we generally mean by advertising. It is known as something above the line. When you are talking with uh, the ad agencies, okay, you'll be talking in this kind of terminology that I want to go for the following in terms of okay, the above the line and I want to go for the following in relation to below the line. Okay, the below the line is what we call promotions. And uh, a promotion covers activities which are basically designed to increase sales okay, by offering an inducement such as extra product, free gifts, sampling and um, the competitions. The basic purpose of uh, the promotions is to increase the usage of the product in the short term with a long term objective that uh, whatever you undertake for the short term is going to have its impact uh, for the long term. Now whether that has an impact for the long term or not uh, remains to be seen. And uh, there's a lot of debate on uh, promotions nowadays, uh, whether the companies should carry out promotions or not, or whether the companies should carry out promotions uh, to the level and degree uh, that those are being carried out by uh, so many companies all over the world. Uh, it, they, you know, there's a heated debate nowadays. Uh, there are um, the pros and cons, which uh, I shall be talking about a little later. Promotions, like I told you earlier, can be divided into two kinds. The one is you know, trade promotions and the other is consumer promotions. Trade promos, call it to see in, in short terminology, are aimed at the trade to entice them into stocking more so that they give our brand more space and better space and sell more. Consumer promos are designed to encourage consumers into buying more. And that is why we go for things like uh, the 10% extra or 20% extra. We go for you know, bigger packs. Um, we get into promotions like uh, the buy two, get one free, or even buy one and get one free. These kind of uh, promotions have got to be the planned in advance of uh, their execution because uh, they, may, they may not uh, be very simple things. They may look kind of simple, but uh, there's a lot of complexity underneath the total effort. Just take a look at uh, the package of uh, detergent which says you know 15% more and uh, you will understand the, the complexity which uh, is there in terms of uh, uh, procurement and uh, the total supply chain. You have to place order uh, from your suppliers in terms of getting a pack which is different in size and uh, which is a little different in terms of graphics and it is going to call for so many different changes at uh, the level of um, uh, the printing uh, and then cutting and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, the implications which these promotions uh, entail have got to be taken into account and for that matter you've got to have a decent level of lead time which is just about not only sufficient but which is adequate for you to plan all the promotions and uh, then are in a position to execute those in a timely and effective manner. With the, the help of uh, the advertising, the, what you basically do is you create a pull. You pull the consumers toward the brand which is sitting at the shelves in the supermarkets. So advertising basically pulls the consumer. And with the help of promotions, you create a push. You push the consumer toward the product. And as the conventional wisdom goes, it is the balance between this pull and push which does the trick for the marketing people. So in other words, if you create a pull, the members of the channel may not be very supportive because they have their own with a point of view. And uh, they think if the companies are spending such a lot of money on communications uh, in creating that pull, 
uh, they should uh, also uh, go for uh, certain kinds of uh, promotions so that the element of push is also there. Now, do not forget that that element of push consists of two things, the consumer promotions and the trade promotions. So, whereas you are pushing the consumer toward the product, the member of the channel, if you also are uh, carrying out certain trade promotions, will feel equally actuated and motivated to push that product toward the consumer. And uh, if you are giving uh, like uh, the buy one and get one free or get this 10% extra uh, for a limited period, uh, they're not um, encouraging the channel members uh, on their part. They may not feel very enthusiastic in terms of giving you the right space in their market and um, uh, the, uh, the amount of space uh, which your brand needs because uh, when you get into these kind of communications, Again, you see, as the experience or the empirical evidence goes, your sales increase. And uh, the increase in sales is going to be undermined if uh, channels uh, are not really receptive and retailers in particular are not in a mood to offer you the right amount of space that you require in the light of those communications. We shall talk about the pros and cons of uh, promotions. Let us now summarize what I've talked about so far. I think our understanding about the, the basic objective of communications is very clear, and that is, number one, to create awareness, and number two is to maintain that awareness, and number three is to uh, actuate your uh, the target market to the take an action, meaning to go and buy your brand. These objectives could be further elaborated like the following. Uh, the brand awareness is uh, all about the information uh, which uh, you provide uh, your customers and your consumers with. They've got to have complete knowledge of uh, the brand and the product, the meaning the benefits the product carries and um, the value uh, it is going to uh, develop uh, and generate uh, for the consumers. These are the kind of things uh, which you talk about while creating awareness. Reinforcing the message means that you've got to make sure that there is a certain level of retention of the message which you have created and which you are communicating and transmitting to the target market in the minds of the consumers. Because it is this retention which is going to lead to the action which your consumers are going to take to buy the brand. This is something which clarifies the brand picture in the minds of the consumers and uh, it also uh, fortifies that picture in their brand if they retain the message. So that is why you talk about these things over and over again. Elaborating on uh, the stimulating the action, uh, you have to motivate your target customers into buying. You see, there is a great chance that uh, the level of awareness is very high and the retention on part of the consumers uh, is also uh, very strong. Yet, uh, there is uh, something you know, which is preventing your uh, the target market uh, to go for the action and buy the product. It does happen in so many different cases. And I would like to explain this thing, uh, this uh, the phenomenon, uh, with the help of examples. And then you will realize uh, how important it is uh, not only to create awareness, to the maintain awareness, but also to do something at a certain uh, the point of communication process with which uh, uh, keeps your customers and consumers uh, motivated uh, into buying your product because that's uh, the name of the game. If they do not buy, just awareness, the maintenance of it and retention of the information into their minds is of no use. Different uh, experts are going to talk about um, uh, the, the concept of uh, uh, communication uh, broken into so many different uh, phases or so many different steps uh, in different ways. But uh, there is a consensus on uh, the one thing and that is that the beginning of the process or the point of departure for this process has got to be awareness and understanding. So the Objectives that I talked about in terms of creating awareness and maintaining awareness 
and uh, the actuating the, the consumer to the buy the product uh, could be related to different steps uh, which um, are involved or which form the communication process. Uh, one of the authors, uh, and I'm referring to the textbook as a matter of fact, you must refer to your um, handouts and uh, I will take the opportunity of requesting and insisting that uh, before coming to uh, the classroom for your lecture, you must go through the handouts very, very carefully and very assiduously. Getting back to in the, what uh, the author of uh, the book or the concept uh, that talks about is also known as author. It is A U T H O R. A stands for awareness, U for understanding, T for trial. Uh, the meaning, uh, if, even if there is awareness and uh, understanding on part of the consumer, uh, the consumer must go for a trial uh, because uh, once the consumer has tried your product and if you believe in your product that it is very well positioned and it carries all the benefits uh, which are needed out there in the marketplace and it is fulfilling the need in a beautiful way, then there is no way uh, that customer uh, will turn away from your product. So that is the significance of the trial. The next letter H stands for happiness. The meaning that once the consumer has tried the product, the consumer should feel so much happy about it that uh, he should go for the product over and over again. The next letter is O. O stands for the only one. What does that mean? Well, it may sound very simple, but basically it refers to the, the positioning. The brand they should be able to make such a beautiful home into the minds of the consumers that they only think about your brand. That is what is meant by the only one. And the last letter of the concept author or the process author is R and R stands for referral. The consumers who are buying a brand they should be so much satisfied and loyal with your brand that they should be referring it to others. And uh, you know uh, why people uh, refer uh, the brands to others. Uh, we did um, do a lot of learning in relation to this concept uh, in uh, the very formative uh, lectures. There are uh, other uh, authors uh, or theorists you know, who talk about uh, a similar concept in uh, the different ways. Uh, and uh, for the sake of comparison, I would like to uh, draw your attention toward the, uh, the illustration uh, which uh, shows us uh, the two models. Uh, the model one is um, I've just talked about and uh, the model two is awareness, comprehension, intention and action. Now it is very clear uh, when we look at uh, this illustration that uh, the awareness is uh, step number one in both the models and uh, the understanding and comprehension uh, being the same thing is step number two in both the models. And um, in model number two, uh, we have intention, which I would say is uh, the combination of, uh, you know, the trial and the happiness uh, the and only one, uh, because uh, if the consumer has tried your brand and uh, he's feeling happy about it, and he really thinks that uh, this is the only one that he should be buying all the time, he certainly has intention to buy it uh, every time he makes the decision to buy that kind of a product. So uh, the intention is a combination of uh, those three steps uh, of model number one. The last uh, the step of uh, the model number two is action, uh, which of course is uh, the last um, step in uh, any given uh, the process of uh, the purchasing, uh, much less uh, the communication, because uh, it is um, at that point uh, that you go and buy. So you have to be uh, very clear about uh, these steps uh, which uh, are going to form the, the process of uh, the communication. And uh, in order to uh, make it uh, very uh, clear, uh, once again, in your minds, uh, I would like to talk about uh, awareness and comprehension as being the, the basic denominators of uh, the strategic process of uh, the communication. And to uh, summarize the whole thing uh, all over again, 
unless there is awareness and comprehension, there is no way that um, the remaining steps of uh, the concept uh, with, are going to be followed. Uh, they will not be fulfilled and hence the strategic framework in relation to communication will remain kind of lopsided and unfulfilled. I would like to summarize by saying that uh, I've talked about uh, what communication is, the importance of communication in the context of uh, the overall strategic framework you know, for your brand and uh, the elements of uh, communication are different tools of communication and the essence of communication in terms of uh, the communication process. Uh, the by way of uh, the talking about the concept known as author, uh, once you understand the essence of the concept, the next question which uh, must flash into your mind is, uh, what is it that uh, this process does uh, with the consumer? And uh, that is going to be the topic of discussion in the next lecture. Uh, let me explain to you uh, in uh, the very brief words that uh, the process evokes uh, the certain responses uh, in consumers' minds and uh, those responses could be explained uh, with the help of certain effects uh, that take place again in the mind of the consumer and that is going to be the discussion of the next uh, topic and based on that we shall be talking about strategies and then how to fit different tools which sound so simple into the strategic framework meaning where advertising should come in and where should promotion go and where event marketing comes in so on and so forth i look forward to seeing you talking with you in the next lecture allah hafiz until then